Welcome to your universe. Greetings, fellow free human beings. My name is Chance. Today, as I'm recording this episode, it's the 4th of July, Independence Day, a holiday that people often associate with freedom, of course. But I'm sure you may have noticed the society we live in right now is actually not all that free. And also, the nation state that we call ours is uh, not all that polite to the rest of the world. In fact, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Most of us are also ensnared in some way by a dependency on external institutions and forces, both seen and unseen, but many of them are concealed. I'm actually reading a book right now about the unseen forces in our historical equation called The Secret History of the World by Mark Booth. I'll link to it in the show notes. I highly recommend this one. It covers just about everything from A to Z when it comes from alchemy to Illuminati to... Zoroaster. That's A to Z. There you go. Um, I bring it up, though, because it would be a great tie into the conversation that Haley and I have in this episode with our friend Daniel Belt. Daniel is a generally wise dude, a life coach, and a damn fine student of philosophy, and a good teacher, too. Throughout the episode, we thoroughly discuss natural law, the law of man, and the indivisible correlation between one's thoughts, feelings, and actions in juxtaposition to their current reality situation. In The Secret History of the World, Mark Booth explains the origins and development of human consciousness and physical evolution in the context of the ancient wisdom traditions and the secret societies of today that trace their origins back thousands of years. To rituals like the Eleusian Mysteries in ancient Greece or the priests of Egypt back when they used those crazy pyramids for whatever the hell they used them for. It's a super mind-blowing book, and it takes most of what we've been conditioned to believe about reality and literally flips it upside down. But it doesn't take a genius to see that we're already in an upside-down society where evil is done and called good, and fear allows us to believe that there's any true power and authority. We can learn to overcome these dependencies. When one taps into their true, original self, their source, there's really no longer a need for authority. Original thinking is similar to intuitive knowing because it's coming from source. That means it's undistorted, uncultivated, and full of energy. Well, I guess it could be cultivated, but it's unchanged. Um, It's the original truth. Actually, cleaning your own ego filter to the point where you can recognize and express the originality of your own source is the obstacle that must be achieved in order to eliminate illusionary limitations and discover one's personal genius. A huge part in actually achieving this transformation is purifying and strengthening your body to the best of your ability, a task that's way too large to do all at once. But when taken a day day and a step at a time, it's completely possible. One very important step that I would suggest because I recently did this would be to acquire a showerhead that filters harmful chemicals out of your water. If you're on a city water system that pumps chlorine and chemicals in, you really want to get this. I brought it up last episode too because I found a super good deal on Amazon for these, like 30 bucks. And I'm not directing you to Amazon as a podcasting affiliate because I have no sponsors other than you guys, the listeners. I'm just linking it because it's probably a key factor in your development that you possibly are overlooking, especially in terms of reducing the toxicity level in your body over the long term. I actually asked our guest Daniel about this very thing after we had finished our interview. And he had so much to say on the subject that I turned the mics back on and we spoke for like 10 more minutes. So I'm going to play that brief chat now. I guess it'd kind of be like a preview to the rest of the episode because I have more things to tell you about before the full conversation. But I think the way he presents various arguments for why chlorine is seriously crazy to shower in and it'll convince you to at least go check the episode notes and find the link to this very inexpensive shower filter that I just got and I had zero trouble installing and using. Um, So basically, the thing about filtering chlorine in your shower, filtering chlorine, period, chlorine has a purpose in a home by keeping algae and fungus and things at bay, but we should absolutely in no ways be ingesting it. And it's one of those powerful and deadly chemicals that exist. It disorganizes bacteria, and your DNA stems from the bacteria in your gut and your digestive system. And so when you ingest it, it causes your DNA to be disorganized because the bacteria can't function in accordance with what they're supposed to be doing. So you can't assimilate nutrients the same way. You can't eliminate things, waste the same way. You can't 
which means you can't make hormones the same way, which all kinds of effects because chlorine is anti-life. <laughs> and so, and it comes in proportions, especially like springs and things like that, that are good for humans. But we've ultra concentrated one of the most deadly chemicals on earth. So like, you know, there's many minerals in water, but now we've removed all the other minerals that mattered, which would be potassium, magnesium, trace minerals. Those are all good for us. And instead, in, increased fluorine, and uh, chlorine, and that has deranges the nervous you mean system. Fluoride? No, I meant fluorine. Fluorine. Um, but, or fluoride. It, it 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 doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but it yeah, fluoride, uh, chlorine, and those uh, the those derange the nervous system. It it breaks up ecosystems, and your entire outside of your body is covered in bacteria. All your nose, your ears, your mouth. Every part of you, all of your digestive tracts, your kidneys, your, all of it, and you're putting in things that disorganize the bacteria. And so normally, and this is why food is the way it is, and I, I'd use the principle of like local honey. So we know that if we eat local honey, then if we, uh, we're inoculated. The bees fly around, it picks up local pollen, moves into the honey, and then we eat it, and we're inoculated versus local allergens. Well, that's why all food is supposed to be local, because whatever you eat locally inoculates you versus what is in your area, right? Well, if you spray that and none of that bacteria is there and it doesn't get to fulfill its function and you eat it, there's nothing in there to inoculate you versus things that you should not be sick in in your own environment. And so, and as it deranges the DNA over time, that affects your genetics and how your genes express themselves. So not only is it a... Um good idea to get a chlorine and chemical filtering shower head like I just did. But also another step would be to filter even like the tap water on your sink, because when you go to wash your produce, you're killing bacteria in the same absolutely. way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the bacteria that's on every food exists for a purpose. Every food on earth is covered in bacteria because it is required by your body to break down proteins, fats, all kinds of things. And without it, you can't do it. And that's what aging is. Aging is how hard your organs have to work from not fulfilling your nature. <laughs> and so now that your body has to do all this work that bacteria was initially meant to do, now your body has to use up its limited abilities in order to do it. And then it also affects gene expression and things like that. And yeah, tap water isn't suitable for anything really other than like cleaning your cabinets or something to that effect. You know, water is actually water, like hydration is different than water. Your tap water really isn't hydrating and you could eat. So for example, if you ate a celery stick, you would get more hydration than you would from three glasses of tap water probably. Now, there's exceptions to the rule if you have a well or whatever, but most often it's minerals that create hydration. Minerals create hydration, not the liquid. So if I remove all the minerals and electrolytes like potassium, magnesium, you know, sodium, all the, then you have no chemicals that allow all the metabolic functions to go on your body. And you're putting, and so your ability to fight infections in your kidneys and places in your body, because it's all bacterial aligned all of your kidneys and so when that's all deranged it can't fight infections the same way it doesn't regulate blood sugar the same way it has massive effect and water is the second most needed element on earth after oxygen you know and it's not close <laughs> like we and we are water and so and it matters and the other thing happens is when you have concentrations of chemicals and water molecules they don't form structures the same way so people don't think about it this way but really water is a, cr a liquid crystal that's what it is it is actually a crystal it's not actually a liquid it's a crystal in liquid form and these have symmetry that's why every snowflake has a certain symmetry and everyone's unique because every water molecule is unique like humans and if i put it in the microwave for example or if i derange it chemically it can no longer form crystalline structure and when we put it into us, considering that 70% of our constitution, 70 plus percent of our constitution, it has an unbelievable effect on the ability to transfer information throughout the whole body, to completely disorganize the genetic expression, the assimilation of nutrients, the elimination of waste. Um, there's not enough hours <laughs> to describe how crazy it is. And that literally the thing that you are acquired to proactively get more than any other thing, because you're going to get oxygen 
first. That's the most important thing. So I have to go outside because on average, there's about 17 times as much oxygen outside this room as there is inside this room. Hmm. So you have to spend 17 days indoors to get what you get one day outdoors of the most vital element to a human or most vital nutrient. So oxygen is a nutrient, not an element. I mean, it's both, but it's a nutrient. And so, and right there at number two is water. And so as we increase the quality of our water, then in turn, our own body increases its own symmetry and its ability to pass information. It's not coincidental that your all our good fats have to do with the symmetry of the, the expression within a fat molecule. And our brain is all fat and water and minerals. <laughs> and this has a profound effect on how we think and how we turn out. And that's what I was getting at earlier. So if you, if you drink artesian water, spring water, clean water, you're well hydrated, you eat good food, then the genes that are expressed that can only be achieved over decades can only be done over that time. You can't do it in the next year, isn't possible. Because your cells, so in the next seven years, are going to get the all process of dying off making new. They'll be better. But then what you're doing after that time will continue to be better. It will continue to be better at everything it does, just like anything you ever have ever done. Anything you continued to do, you got better at. Hmm. Ever. It's the nature of all things. And so it's like also if a spring pops up in the desert, what happens? The most beautiful spot anything's anybody's ever seen, and there's not another living thing in any direction that that anybody can even see or travel to and live, <laughs> you know, and, but it can create the most lush, beautiful, verdant living place that there is. And, and that's, that water is intrinsic to our own quality in ways that I don't think we really directly relate, you know, and actually the best way to be hydrated is through, hydrated is through food and less through water. Because when you eat celery, cucumbers, peppers, all those things, especially they aren't chemically deranged, allowed to fulfill the nature, as we do that, our organization increases and we become conduits. That's literally what we are. We're like antennas. You know, that's what humans are. We're literally conduits. And our ability to pass things through it is based on it not to be oxidized, not to be malfunctioning. And that in turn gives us as access to things that you can never know otherwise. So if you continue to get better at your own nature for the next 20 years, you will have a whole series of things you have no concept of right now because you couldn't. And that would even include the external world too, because your internal evolution it can, it directs the way that the wave function of potential of your external reality is going to collapse into. Yeah, and it, and it is. I mean, we're we're Christians by deed. Well, what we do is who we become. You know, and I was for, and you could even, there's all kinds of metaphors you use. We're the book of deeds. Like, I'm just a peasant, right? So, but I can walk into any store and just through observation, and I'm not even going to say education, just observation. I could tell you exactly where your desires lie. If you love beer, I could tell you. And I'm just the guy looking. If you love donuts, I could tell you. If you love exercise, I could tell you. If you love not sleeping and staying up all night, I could tell you. You mean you can tell by looking at the person? Yeah, I can tell all kinds of things about what you love that you don't even know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, And that's how most people live. And so as we connect those things, as we connect them to the the one ritual, the, the only ritual you have to do is your nature, which is get food, get nutrition, and get sleep. Eliminate waste. That's it. And if you do all those things effectively, you will be, think, a person you could never be or know otherwise. And it will be greater than it's ever been. At any age, it's true for every single age. There's no thing that changes that. Whether you're, if you've got a liver and you're 70, or it, the same principle applies to you, is it everything you unburden to that guy's liver is going to help them in the same way it's going to help you. And we think that it's a, that there's age or time. It's all, it's all built just BS. It's literally what we're doing. It's always, and that's why it's never the knowing. The knowing is part of the problem. If you're ever knowing and not doing, you're actually make, you're creating debt. And if you are just doing, regardless of what you're knowing, you're never doing anything but creating. So what do you mean? What do you mean by that? If you're knowing but not doing, that means like you're creating sort of, debt within yourself. You so, you know the right thing, and you're okay. not doing the right thing. And when you do that, you know you're lowering yourself. And there by itself is an energy inside of you, like a seed. And again, whatever you plant will grow. Everything you feed grows. Every single thing, for good or for ill. 
you know, and that's why that kind of the back to the clarity and heaven and health thing is like, well, if you, you could pull the weeds out once you see them, huh. put good stuff in. I mean, if you've ever grown plants, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. You can make it look amazing or you could look like shit. I've seen all kinds of gardens, <laughs> you know, Mine's but a it's in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just saying, but I'm more meant it as intrinsic to you, you know, as, as we discover those things that are that way, that you will become beautiful in a way that you could never know otherwise. And one that is beyond anything that we could, that words could not describe. I mean, language is limited, you know, and, uh, but we are beyond our own dreams. Like we can never even begin to even dream in, in a dream, not even like daydreaming what the possibilities are for ourselves, you know, but there's also tied to the intrinsic nature and that it just mean be nourished. And those foundational elements. So, you know, filter your water guys. That's what, yeah, that's what we're trying <laughs> to get across. It yeah. really matters a lot, way, way more than is taken. It's, everyone takes it for granted pretty much. Yep. I'm sure you're pretty eager to get to the rest of our talk with them. And I will, but first I have a question for you. Are you subscribed to this podcast on the iTunes podcast app yet? If not, please just go look it up and do that so you won't miss an episode that you want to hear. And while you're there, leaving a five-star review for the show will help us reach a larger community by bumping us up in the search rankings. Of course, just spinning your attention on us by listening to the show is a huge energetic boost and we love you for it. But if you really like Interverse, the best thing to do is to go to Patreon and pledge some Federal Reserve debt notes or dollars, you could call them, to us so we can get better gear and make a better podcast. Really, I want to go full time with this, and that would mean a lot more content, too. So all the support helps every little bit, whether it's $1, $5, $25 a month. And I will be offering you rewards along the way. So just go to the show notes and you'll find a link to patreon.com forward slash interverse. And the sign up process is super easy. It allows you guys to crowdfund the podcast with zero need for commercials, advertisements, or sponsorships while giving you rewards based on the level of support. Like behind the scenes, a feed of posts of who knows what, could be anything. Uh, I will share artwork and you can use that royalty-free permission granted wherever you like, whatever you like. And I'll be adding more of that as I go. And also there's a back catalog of older episodes that you can't find anywhere else. No corporations or investors direct this mind ship. We are fully supported by our fellow community of artists, musicians, seekers, healers, friends, aliens, whatever you want to be. I'll name a few right now because it's actually the beginning of a new month and patrons that pledge $5 or more will get a shout out on a monthly basis. And we have a couple different people pledge now too, starting this month. So these are the super souls that are helping out big time in making this podcast a reality. Of course, my mom and dad, Tim and Kathy, Jeff Severson, who is quickly becoming a Jedi, Beth Naturno and Blake Sewells, Elise Myers, Chris Abert. Chris and I will actually be working together to do some broadcasting together at an upcoming festival, so there will be some interesting developments there. It's called Darkening of the Sun, and it's actually in Missouri, I think fairly close to St. Louis, and there will be a direct view of viewing of the eclipse. It's right in the path. Damn, I have to ask off work for that. Anyway, you guys don't need to know about that. Other than you do need to go find the link to Darkening of the Sun that I'll put in the show notes because if you're in the area, you might want to check it out. I'll definitely be talking more about it in the upcoming episodes. Uh, Apple Annie's next sponsor. Thank you, Annie. Steven Singer, thanks, dude. Hannah Durkee, Peter Merrick. And the new patrons are Paul Frank and Nathan Crabtree. Thank you guys very much. All right, we've wrapped that up. We can move on to the episode with Daniel Belt about freedom and fulfilling our true natures. Thanks again for listening, guys. Share the show. We love you. And... She was saying that it's the same sun, and I felt like this before. Yeah, it's because time it literally doesn't even exist. Like, you're the same person. The sun's just on the front side. It went to the back side, and now it's back on the front side for us. You know, so you are that same person. You've always been that same person. My, well, what he was talking about is earlier I was, um, I thought of the sun, and I was like, I had like a random just flashback to laying on a trampoline when I was a kid and laying in the sun, and I was like, man, the sun is just kind of uh 
a metaphor for like the because it's not unchanging eventually the sun will die like any other sure. star mm -hmm. but it's kind of like a metaphor for what is unchanging in the universe in that um it's always there it's always the same and it's kind of how he how how you change how what you get from it so maybe you're in the desert and you are dying of thirst the sun is going to be detrimental to you in that case but maybe you are freezing to death and you it's nighttime and the sun will warm you up and in that way it will save you but the only thing that has changed in those situations is your position to the sun so yeah absolutely absolutely yeah, and, and to wisdom as well, because wisdom tells you to stay away from areas of peril. And the sun teaches you that I will keep you warm at this time, and this time I can't protect you. And so we, that's why we should move closer to the truth the same way, because that's what protects us. And it's indefensible. Like, there's literally no defense against the truth. If somebody assails it, it doesn't matter. It literally makes all, th it makes every action indefensible even. You know, and that's what the samurai and things like that believe too. You know, it's just like indefensibility or invulnerabilities in yourself where if you just act according to truth, it wouldn't even matter what you say. It wouldn't matter if you had a hundred guys yelling at you. If you knew that if you knew that your action was true. And and I think we see this play out today, especially with young young people and kids, because they'll be like acting in accordance with their own truth, but it's so subjective, you know, like it, I don't know how to describe exactly where I was going with that. <laughs> well, they, they'll have uncovered some aspects of the truth, but they haven't had the experience to learn different uh, types of prudence, I guess, and common sense. Uh, there's, there's like the, there's like the hypothetical truth that you uh, have intuitively coming to you at all times, but then you also have to test that in faith against your actual external reality and then be like the wisdom aspect is where you learn what was and wasn't correct about that starting hypothesis and that's where you then to make a revision yeah and that's da vinci said that as well you know pretty much that's experiential you know level of application of wisdom and that's kind of what i was getting at you know it's like knowing it is enough you actually have to live it and that's again kind of getting back to the point of invulnerability and how we feel so if if you if i do if you do something really underhanded to me right and you know it and i come at you like dude you did this it was so crappy i just man and you know you did it and you'd be either react like oh you'd draw in on yourself and feel like a heel like a terrible person or you'd be like man whatever you'd come at it really confrontationally but if you know that your actions are in accordance with truth, then you could have 20 people yelling at you and you still wouldn't care. It would actually elicit no emotional response. And then you're like, I feel pretty good about this. You're flipping out, but I maintain where I am because I know that I have acted in accordance with only that which is true to the best of my ability. And yeah, so I was, that's kind of what I was getting at it a little bit ago about the like invulnerability aspect of it is, which is like when you, when, when all of your actions become true and you can always speak that way, then there's no adversary that can come against your principle. You know, there literally, there is no, because you know, and that's, you know, the aspect of being aware, being aware of the truth and being close to it and that it is what it is. And it's not what you think. So with saying that, it's kind of like if you do realize like that you're if you do realize that you're starting to get angry or um, feeling negatively about it, you know, that's how you know you are wrong. Yeah, so that's how on the flip side, the people who are yelling, they should be like, oh, I'm angry right now. That means maybe I'm in the wrong here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you're talking about Da Vinci, that's somebody um, I haven't done a ton of studying on him, but actually. We spoke one time and you told me to check out the journals of Da Vinci and I, uh, I read them for a while, but I have this problem where I just keep starting new books and not finishing old things. But I guess it's not a problem because I can always return to them at the proper moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was fascinating for me to find out about Da Vinci that he pretty much did all of his own experiments to prove any principle that he was going to work with. He never just took somebody's word for it out of a book or something. And uh, that includes like just like even the basic uh, building blocks of physics experiments all the way up to 
some of his more crazy experiments. Yeah. And that's what led him to be one of the greatest thinker and, you know, since Socrates, essentially, you know, like it really is what propelled because he propelled humanity forward by the inventiveness of his original thinking. And the original thinking is the most important thing to a human being. And that, you know, you and he talks extensively actually about not dressing oneself in others letters. Like, why do you if you give me this certificate to tell me I'm a thinker? I'm already down the path. I don't want to be down. He's like, that's your letters. That's important to you. I'll accept that I went through the same thing you did, but I don't need your paper or your approval for me to know that I'm a great thinker and a great person and, and have much to contribute. And that when you realize that you always just have things to contribute and you don't dress yourself in others' letters, but you live specifically as Ex through experiential experimentation is the way that he would label it. Like you must experiment and experience that experiment to understand the fundamental aspect of the way nature is. And he's talking about natural law, the observance of natural law. He was one of the greatest observers of the actual natural law of the human body, physics, all these things. But he learned it through experimenting and the experience of experimenting and not taking for granted, while listening to others said, saw it bear out in principle. And he was able to greatly forward think by hundreds of years things that wouldn't be invented except by him. You know, and it came and he absolutely believed that the grace, greatest attribute to a human being was like the ability to be observant and to fulfill nature. And that comes from the original mind. The nature is continuously perpetuating itself in exactly the manner that suited to itself. And that we were meant to be doing the same thing. And I'm paraphrasing, like, you know, I'm kind of condensing it down. He obviously had many other things to say on that. But that's basically describing the process of evolution. Yes. That the whole, the whole reality is going through all times constantly. I yeah. think you said yesterday that there would be no evolution without originality, which are two things that were just mentioned. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. It's too clearly tie in together. Yeah. With originality, I... Uh, it's defying expectation. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, what's, what's very clear to me uh, in, in the last year or so as I've been going through things I've been reading is that uh, the, I, the notion that stuff that's old is therefore not relevant is so crazy. And what you're talking about with original thinkers, um, there's so many original thinkers that you could go back to. And whenever you plug into their stream of consciousness, like, or even just read other people trying to describe the greatness of what they're thinking, you can learn so much. Uh, specifically, I just did a lot of reading about Pythagoras. And <laughs> yeah. Fascinates me the connection between, um, the, the connection between the origins of science and physics and philosophy uh, with mystery schools and mystery traditions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, to a level that is both historic and transcendent simultaneously and in a way that is about profundity. It's about profundity. It's about the profound nature of things themselves and our ability to illustrate those things to ourselves and then to others and the you talk about transmission to be able to even go to talk to pythagoras you would have to first be an architect and you would also have to be a doctor before he would teach you math and you had to learn, oh well you had to have a pretty good idea of arithmetic already from what i understand and oh yeah to be an accomplished musician yeah, it was really amazing. And, but again, that's just about the originality of a complete being. And, and also the difference between, you know, like we are all the same in that we are human and we all share the same humanity, but we do not share the same talents and we do not share the same abilities. And so that's where we have to be original for us. It's the only answer because we all share those in varying capacities that are unique to ourselves. And, you know, being able to distill that down requires wisdom. That's very difficult because it's very simple and everything is becoming more intricate while wisdom never changes anything other than being simple. It just gets harder to see a lot of times. But this is true, you know, through all of history and it's true now. It's not different. Like our society doesn't make us less capable. If anything, we're more capable. We can bring together our inventiveness. We can bring together our technology. And especially with the right application of force and energy, um, you can puncture any wall and do things that we can't even dream of, you know, like truly 
we are in but shadows of what our dreams even could be. Like, you know, if you, if you figure out, if you thought of yourself in 10 years, like idealistic, idealistically, not practically, strictly idealistic, like I would be Superman. I would be the greatest thinker. I'd be the greatest man. I could be even what, however you would define that as it is actually a shadow of what is possible because our knowledge of what is possible is so tiny. You know, and as you t- and we are rewriting all these pathways in our brain by the nature of the way we t- talk, the nature of the way we act. Because right now I'm just emitting energy, you know, like that's what I'm doing with you and what we're doing with each other. And I'm arranging wavelengths with my tongue and they're floating across this room and impacting your sonic dictionary. And it literally has a physical, biophysical, measurable effect upon you. And so it matters very much the nature and manner into the energy that's put into it. And that's what mind to mind transmission is. And that was what historically has always been valued. Like, you know, if you look in, you know, from the Taoist perspective, especially I'd say is the most actionable aspect of that. But you see that in Tibetan culture. Uh, you see that in all kinds of cultures. It's amazing. And talking about that, uh, greater potential, which I would say is truly limitless. That is, uh, the extent of our actual potential. Um, the reason why we would, the reason why these uh, face-to-face transmissions work more clearly, I think, is because you're, as you're talking about, like there is that actual energetic transfer. Um, the wisdom is carried, the truth is carried in the logos, as the philosophers would. Yeah, say. absolutely. Uh, the language itself is alive and trying to always wake people up to truth at all times. And to the extent that many words have um, basically obvious um, below the surface meanings, meanings uh, that you can just piece together by the sounds of the word. And anyway, the fact that truth is alive and contained within language is why you don't get um, you don't get like one textbook that tells you everything you need to know about the world. Uh, Mystery traditions like we were talking about before and like Pythagoras would have been involved with, uh, they only transmitted orally for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. Because it is, it is the only way to transmit it. <laughs> you know, like the others give us inspiration, but it does not give us understanding. And understanding comes from our shared humanity, and that's the thing we all share. And if we, when we seek out to that which is best for ourselves, but also that which is best for others, at the same time, we can do both. That's how we unlock that potential. That's how we give every person the ability to define for themselves their own life, you know, and within this, the the two truths, I think it's like singing harmony. I think there's this universal harmony that goes through things and every person has to find that pitch. And when those two sounds come in alignment, it's beautiful. So we have our personal truths, which is the truth that you and I might live by, but they're different. But there's also the universal truth, the thread that runs through both of us. You know what I mean? So I don't like believe truly that there's just, there's not a single truth. There is the truth by which nature propels itself forward to the best of our understanding. But there's also your perception of it and how, at what level are you willing to assert your own capacity? And then that, that in turn determines our reality and our ability. So there's limitless principles that are there to be discovered. But in terms of actual natural law, things that you could do wrong, you could say violations of law. They're actually pretty few, I would say. They're incredibly few. It's don't take more than your share. Apologize and mean it. (laughs) Get good rest and good sleep. Uh, Love the life while you're here. Love the body human. Uh, Be compassionate to every person. Uh, You know, like it's not, it's meant so five-year-olds can have it. If it isn't, if a five-year-old can't get it, it really isn't wise. We might be interesting. Um, it does not lift us. Those things never lift us. What lifts us is the impetus of our action, why we're acting the way that we're acting. You know, and especially having the most compassion for those we struggle the greatest with, because they're the furthest from our own understanding and maybe even their own. You know, we may not even come to understand it till 10, 15, 20 years later when our own experience may lead us to the same path, which I think happens a lot. It's easy to pontificate when you don't know any better. <laughs> but that being said, but that being said, you can still tell people kind of uh, 
what they should do based on your experience and what you're seeing there um, in a way, as long as it's not coming in a judgmental way. I think um, wisdom does, like we're talking about, it comes from talking. So uh, one thing about our society is that it implants the idea that, like we're talking about with, with kids having their own idea of truth and then testing it and finding out what does and doesn't work, where people are being trained to think that their whatever they think is okay is the truth that like mm, yeah. basically that things are only relative truth is just relative and <clears throat> that that does get kind of dangerous i would say <laughs> it's not dangerous it's wrong it's wrong there's a difference in those things and we can call water wet you know like it, there's a point and you're right when i say when i was talking about earlier and pontificating things i mean about glib talk which is the opposite of human transmission it's the literal diametric like opposite and it is absolutely wrong for us to perpetuate onto and with others truths that are not beholden to our natures and, and are coercive or any nature, anything of that kind of nature. And there are universal truths, which comes down to when I say don't take more than your share, you, you people could call it gluttony or you could, these actually really are deadly to us. It's, it's a mentality that, oh, if I'll take more than my share here, especially of food, which is the only thing you're required to do as a human. The only thing you must do today is go get food. <laughs> so on a base human level, it's the most basic human shared experience that exists on earth. There is nothing greater than that. And if you're willing to take the most basic thing from another and have more and they have less, then it's not the lack of food that's the problem. It's the lack of humanity. And we you know, waste like 50% of our food. Is that right in this country? It's, a lot of the produce just because of the visual of it being visually unappealing just thrown away fresh produce and not just produce either but how much food just gets thrown out in restaurants because it's expired or oh yeah whenever i worked um i worked at a place that had donuts and they would throw away over a hundred sometimes just that that were really not bad well but... they might have been bad oh well they were bad <laughs> but for, they weren't stale they, but they were bad for other reasons right <laughs> right <laughs> I understand. Or the like, gas station donuts. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and again, I look at that as being a serious problem. I've done the same thing when I was younger and worked in fast food and some of these other jobs that I had had uh, a long time ago now. Um, and But again, now, and it, I, to be honest, I, I would be righteous, self-righteous, but it was also somewhat righteous. Like, look, they're starving. I've watched other people eat grass in other lands to live. Like, and to us, to throw away food makes me angry. It makes me angry, and I'm okay with being angry about it. I don't let it control me. I don't let it turn to violence ever, but I let it drive the energy and fuel the fire because I shouldn't be okay with while people are starving all around us and homeless, and we're throwing away food. And so that's the way what used to drive me. I'm an ex-soldier as well. So you know some of those things come through in that time. But what I came to understand later, it's more the lack of human transmission again. The idea that we're even wasting, like the, we're even producing food of that kind of level in nature is ignorant hmm. and counterintuitive to the health and well-being of every human. And it doesn't mean you can't have fried chicken. You can't have fried chicken. But you can't have chicken that has in no way fulfilled its own nature, is nothing but just messed up, drugged up, biochemically changed things in ways that aren't conducive for humans and expect us to be well or them to be well. We have to allow these things to fulfill their nature so we can fulfill ours because ours is amazing. Like, and that's what I also know is like if we, and the human body regenerates, and that's its nature. Like, so its nature is to never to degenerate. It is always to degenerate, to, gen, to regenerate. Because so like if we, and I've used this example before, but if we all go into a coma for 50 years and you cut to the bone, the cells will instantly renate like they were, were before you were injured. And you can't even say no. You might give up long before your body gives up. The last thing that will ever leave you will be your body. And at any moment in your life, when you, at any moment, no matter what the scenario, when you go back to fulfilling its nature, which is like not overburden the organs, to give it things it needs in the way it was meant to be had, that's the key phrase. Food and things that we take into us on earth grow in the manner that is best for humans. Now, whether you're a creationist or an evolutionist or, or the, any spectrum that could possibly be between and outside of those things, the results are the same. Over time, these things were made 
in a manner that is best for humans. And we have in turn been able to learn how to produce these in better and higher qualities. We see that in the organic gardening movements and things like that. I don't like the legalisms of all of it because it inflates prices, it's crazy and all that stuff. But when things allow them to fulfill our nature, then we can be something we could never be otherwise. So like in addition to the fact that we regenerate all the time, we replicate every cell in our body for our entire life. So every seven years, there's a process between all your glands and organs where the cells will die off and replicate. Well, what comes to you then can be better than what it was before if it's the elemental quality, like the fats, the proteins, and all that stuff is better because that's what makes your brain. That's literally what all your nerves are coated in is fat and protein instruction. Bacteria is what gives your DNA instruction. And if that is all fulfilled in a manner that's more in accordance with your nature, then in the future you can think, be, and feel in a way you could never do otherwise if you did not obey the biological law unto which you must operate regardless of how much we think that we can manipulate that law. That was brilliant. That's what I've been trying to tell people uh, for quite a few many weeks or months now is just that if you're not making – um, steps towards improving the quality of your food intake because there's pretty much a never-ending ladder when it comes to that, I would say, and not being scientific about it. And I'll admit I'm not as scientific about it as I could be compared to Haley, especially. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be better. Exactly. You just have to be better than you were yeah, before. That's all that matters. Everything yeah. else is bullshit. Everything else is bullshit because it is only about being better. Who doesn't fall down? Who doesn't make mistakes? You know, it is literally like, and this is, and I was listening to this guy, Faraz Sahabi, which is a guy I really dig a lot. And he's a coach. And, you know, he's like, toughness is about literally coming to the place in your life where you will always see that there's a chance. That so like and and he's a combat like a mixed martial arts coach and whatever, but like the thing is he's like if 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 you in your mind are negative you're gonna believe that things are stacked against you and as soon as you start to get hurt or lose you'll give up and quit. But he's like if I go against somebody who believes that there's always a chance that there's never if I'm awake there's a chance that person I can never be I could beat him that day he'll come back the next day. I could beat him every day for three years if he if it's intrinsic to him and he lives in a way where he sees opportunity in every struggle. There's also another great book called The Obstacle is the Way. And it and, and Da Vinci talks about this as well, talking about genius. He's talking about genius is literally about overcoming the problem. That's genius. That is the perseverance and original thinking to overcome that which you have not encountered. You know, and so Frost is kind of alluding to a lot of the same thing. And when you literally view that every struggle you've ever had has made you who you are, and just like a sword comes out of the mold dull, when you roll it against a grindstone, it gets sharp. Only the grindstone makes it sharp. Only the pressure of a mountain makes diamonds. You know, like, and that is, and we think of that as being metaphoric. But it is not. It is literal. The same laws that govern that to be true, the orchid in the desert, or you know, or whatever it is, or we as humans, it's the exact same principle. No difference in those two things. So that's why it's valuable to, like, uh, like you do, Haley, just put yourself through tough things on purpose, like uh, mm. exercise, for example. Yeah, definitely. That's the only way to strengthen yourself at all. And if you don't do that to, if you don't do those hard things now, then they'll come later in a much more difficult way. Yeah. In mm -hmm. exercise, I think is the, actually the most important action you can have in your life. And I don't mean exercise, I'm talking about activities you love and that push and challenge the human body. I don't think that there is any mental thing that you need to know that matters more than you need to stay physical because your body is the gift. This universe is working in our favor. You know, when we, when we measure every law, it always seems neutral. Like this turns out exactly like this. We may, you know, we may not like it. We may like it. It always turns out like this physics and chemistry and whatever. But the truth is, and I think that you probably understand this on a certain level, you know, which is that once we get 
to the place in our lives where we stop stepping in our own shit. And we just quit doing things that don't serve us in a way that is truly what makes us feel enthusiastic because and and feel good about the life, about our own bodies and about ourselves first. There is no other place to go from that because this and the universe, when you really recognize that, you're like, oh, well, this is what's meant for me. And I start doing that. And I start clearing the things out of space. And you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be better. You start walking down that path. Then that other stuff starts to go away. And that means the universe works in your favor as long as you understand how it works. You, you see what I mean? Like once you know shitty food hurts your body and you stop, you literally get better. You could be 70. That will still be true. You could lose. I saw it happen countless times. People lose 100 pounds when they're 70. Simply by choosing different, right? As soon as you, as soon as you realize that there is a, sh- a chance, yes, then, like you said, you can't be stopped. You'll just keep getting better. You'll keep coming back. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just blown away by the the depth of of this conversation already at this point, and I really appreciate that we're we've, that you've come to a lot of the same realizations as have I, especially regarding. Um, this awakening process that we're all collectively going through being really more about the things that we need to say no to and stop doing more than anything that we need to start doing. There are a few things we should start doing that we aren't, but there's far more things to just stop doing. And that makes the getting better process a little bit easier. If you, once you get into a flow of uh, non-attachment and letting go things that don't serve you right as you recognize it. But every time you do, come into one of those obstacles that seems too big to go over or to quit, whatever, that's, that's the moment where your true um, spirit has the opportunity to emerge and you can, you can really make some huge leaps with just a choice. Like uh, I'll liken it to whenever I, uh, like, I guess like a year ago, a half a year ago, I was smoking a vape nicotine cigarette and, um, there, there had been a couple of times where I'd been up to like a level of, okay, here I am ready to just put this down. I don't really want it anymore. And uh, I'd go like put it in a, a cupboard or something. And then maybe it's hours later, maybe it's a few days later because it's there. I haven't truly let go of it. Mm-hmm. I, um, my consciousness returned to a level where I could make the other decision. And because I'd left the door open essentially for myself, then there I was making that same choice again. But uh, I, I came to a higher place of consciousness. I'm driving my car, and I, I realized the, the pattern that I'm in there with, with uh, putting it down but not really putting, getting it put away. And although I did do sort of a – I did do a wrong thing in this, in this story, which was I just threw the thing out the window of my car while I was driving. <laughs> it was a, also a right thing because it, yeah. it, uh, it answered – like. I answered the question for myself when I was capable of it instead of leaving it up to a different version of myself that might not answer the question correctly later. Yeah. I think that's why they have the phrase moment of truth. Like, so we have the truth, but why do we have a phrase that's been around forever called moment of truth? And I think that's what it is. Like, oh, I've got this one moment to get this out of my life. I got to get it out of my life. And I, you know, I agree with what you're saying as far as you shouldn't litter. At the same time, though, it is actually, I'll go by and pick that up and be just fine picking up litter. It's more important that at some point you decided for yourself on your own behalf. You were assertive on your own behalf. And it gets addictive. It gets addictive to be assertive on when you really realize like, oh, I can be more than I can even realize right now. I just have to stop doing something. It was a good point you made, which is like, it's more important to say no to things first. And I kind of, um, when I deal with clients and things like that, what I do is I have them write everything down that they do in a day and everything they want to do in a day on a piece of paper. And then I have them on another piece to put those in order of importance. You know, and the top three are always, regardless of their opinion, <laughs> is go to the bathroom, <laughs> get some sleep, and get nutrition. If you go five days without any of that stuff, you will care more about any of those three things than any other things that exist more than your children. <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's biology. You can't be a diplomat with biology. It just works like that. But everything else you choose to do with your time is a matter of your own 
where you're putting your energy and what, and therefore what results from the work that you've put your energy towards self-serving or, or not. And so what I do is I have them clear out all of it. And so when they write down in the order of importance, I have them tear off the bottom half and let's just work on the top half because you can't do it all. You don't have 20 arms. You don't, you only have so much time and energy in the day. Let's work on what we can work on, you know, and not worry about what you're not going to do. Let's worry about what you will do and start building upon that aspect of, of what you're willing to do first. And so what I have them imagine is that they've cleared out all their space. And so you put biology in as number one, because that's your ability to reason, to feel good. If you don't feel good in your body, there's no peace for you. There's no heaven for you if you feel poisoned in your body or injured and miserable. No, that nothing will make that not feel that way. So, but when you obey the biology rules, which is I eliminate that which I took into me, I made getting the aspect of getting my body nourished in the manner of its orientation happen today and it'd be a primary aspect. And when I restored my body, we call it rest, but it comes from the word restoration, because that's when the body shuts off the nervous system and starts all these things about keeping you young and making you happy. And so when you do that first and then, so you, and that's what I do is I try to help them focus because that's the key thing, the power of observation. You have to observe that biology is number one. It is your nature. It is the only reason you'll ever get anything done. The only gift you came in this world with is your body. Your soul came to your body to make it happen. And it is your vehicle and tool by which all things will stem from it. So it's not that the body follows the mind. The mind follows the body. It's the other way around. And when we pay homage to that which governs it, we can think and be and feel the way we can't ever know otherwise. And so when you do that, and the next thing is they realize, okay, well, these are the things that are actually the most directly related to my quality of life. The next thing I have them do is like, now what matters to you most? Out of all of those things you get written down that matter, which one in your heart? And I'll spend a lot of time talking to them. Like, well, let's get down. What made you happy when you were 13? And you, you loved swimming or diving or whatever. It could be anything. It could be whatever you loved. But the thing is, if it made you happy then and you learned to be an adult, do you not think it would make you happy now? Do you think that the joy of a child is not the joy that you can have? You know, and then I have them try to try to help them identify that which is important that, that you must act and work and do things and provide for family or whatever it is. But we really need to get by that which creates enthusiasm in your life because enthusiasm is the most important thing. Enthusiasm will overcome any level of exhaustion. You could go for three days and you could be spun out of your mind and have nothing left in your body, wrenched dry like an old rag and have nothing and on the ground. And if the thing you think is the coolest thing ever just shows up right there, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm so ready. I can easily <laughs> prove what you're saying with a very simple metaphor. If you were about to go to bed, you're super fucking tired. Um, it's been a long week. You barely got any sleep all week. And you're just like, I don't, I want nothing but sleep. I can barely even keep my eyes open. But then I came over to your house and I said, dude, dude listen, listen. In the morning, you're going to get $12 million in the morning. There's no way you'd be able to sleep. Yeah. You would be so fucking jazzed <laughs> up and excited. And that's a stupid example because it's money. But – I mean, it's, it's not a it stupid example. It represents freedom for so many people. And yeah, if that's what that's it is, true. you know? Yeah. And, and no, that's a, that's a prime and apt. It's just what I mean. Like when you find that thing in your life and you've learned to see it clearly. And in my mind, you know, like heaven and hell is about clarity. And that's it, you know, because I've seen the most perfect and beautiful things. I don't need it to be more than that. I've seen selfless, absolutely heroic, selfless acts in my life, uh, endless levels of charity that are completely anonymous that nobody would ever know and they would never want to be known for that. Uh, and I've seen perfect moments. I've, I've, I have a child, and so when I've held him and he wanted nothing from me but just to be with me, not even necessarily love, because it's just what they feel for you. <laughs> You know, I just want to be with you. And so like those perfect moments exist and just like hell does too. You know, like there'd be, I know people who are in hell every day. They could have everything they ever wanted, but it's the way it's the, that they can't see it. And depression's that way. And that's why we really, I think so much too, like especially when we don't use the body and depression really comes, you know, depression is about not seeing. 
You could be in your room and this might be everything that you love, like the things that you love in your life, but it's like having the light off. You know, it's all around you. You know it's there. You're in your room, but you still can't see it. You yeah, know? The, the reason why people get stuck in depression is because they know that when they turn the light on, there's a lot of stuff that they're going to have to clean up. But if they just don't look at it, um, it doesn't keep it from continuing to get more and more messy. And that's a big issue with, uh, I guess, like activism and people that want to change the world that are not able to make changes for themselves yet. And that's the backwards order of doing things. If you can't even keep your own house clean, then how are you supposed to be of any use to anybody? Yeah. And I know that's not meant to be a metaphor, but that's exactly why we're in the political situation we're in now is it has not grown. The thing is we've had a weak bunch of pretenders for generations and they've not had to fight. So they're not tough. They're weak. We've had a bunch of weak people up there trying to protect the best interests of whoever's involved there now. And so now, because activism used to be, and I'm not suggesting we go back to these things. I want to see history isn't just revolved. It, history doesn't always repeat itself. There is another answer to how this stuff can turn out. It's not A to B, A to B, A to B all the time. There are C and a bunch of other things too. And that's where we have to get because we have allowed weakness. And because, you know, it's just like, Oh, what would be the phrase? Like Jimmy Hoffa, you know, he'd have to get out with the unions and literally fight with a ball bat to get 35 cents an hour and any kind of a day off. And they would have to, senators used to get in the street and physically fight business owners so that they could get a day off or something crazy. You know what I mean? Like this is really hard stuff and I'm not suggesting return to that, but that's how tough it is. And FDR says this too. It's like, we must be more than vigorous. He was saying 80 years ago, we are on the precipice. Then we were on the precipice of this problem. And what we see now is the weakness of leadership. And because the institutions weren't always, aren't always flawed, it's the way that they turn out and they get locked in this limited cycle. And what's going to have to happen now is a lot of eggs are going to be broken. We don't, we're not going to like the shittiness and the dirtiness of how this is going to turn out. And it's, it's, it is going to be ugly, but we let it go way too long. That's the longer we let it go, the uglier it's going to be. And so it's really ugly right now. And especially in the age of information, because these old orders are trying to hold so tightly to power and they have greater instruments of power, but there's actually far fewer of them because there's many, many more informed people that are realizing, oh my God, we've been being had for a lot for thousands of years. You know, and so what has to happen now is we have to redefine the nature of dialogue. We have to absolutely get away from any of the partisan, any partisans. It's, and I feel this way about identity politics. I don't like it at all. Like if you're an American, that is it. Everything is discrimination against an American. If you're not a criminal, if you've, if you've committed some kind of act like rape or murder and you've lost your rights, you've lost your rights. You don't get your rights. But there should be no other discussion about the division of anybody. Every time we write a law to protect minorities, they find another group to, dis to discriminate against it. They're like, well, that's not in the law, so we can do it. But the thing is, if you make all discrimination versus every woman, man, child, black, white, every ethnicity, every, you just, if you're an American, every right is the same. And that is it, because that's how they divide in Congress. When you get Black Lives Matter and you get the women's groups, they're all just fighting for their one human right, you know, and that's how they divide us. And they run in like our saviors, like they're out protecting us and they're not. They're leading from the back. I think people forget. It's just like this, you know, the, how gay marriage by the Supreme Court, you know, this whole thing that went down a few years ago. They got to remember that everybody who was in charge at that time was against it till the Supreme Court said it wasn't. And it's a conservative court because they realized intellectually they could not defend their discrimination against gay people. And so we have people saying they're for it, but leading from the back. We have to stop doing that. We have to get out and protect everybody. And it's going to be hard. You know, and that weakness, that, that not assessing, that not looking at it and realizing that we're going to have to put this to the grindstone so our next generation doesn't have to fight these fights. We should not be having 
still battles over black rights, women's rights, any of that stuff. We have to constantly battle because they divide everybody like into different groups. And we're all Americans and you can keep your identity. You can still be black and have well, every black organization or white or women or any of that stuff. But we have to unionize. We have to literally get every single, like we are all on the same page and we're bringing one suit and force this kind of national conversation to happen about, look, we're Americans and that is it. There is no other rights. There's no rights for anybody. Children have every right an adult has, you know, with the exception of like voting or something. Actually, like, though, it's uh, not true in schools. You, when you're in a public school, you lose all your rights, according to court cases. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's part of the problem. It, it, we've we've compl- that's the, that's what I'm saying. These have played out in bureaucracy, and a lot of which is intent to be benign, even. But they don't realize the totality of how all these things add up and turn out. And you're right. I, I, it terrifies me the way children are subject to school. They can literally lock down the school and keep my son, and I wouldn't have any say so. You know, and don't get me wrong, I understand the need for having protocols, but these are not the right ones. And it's and that's one symptom of the singular problem is that there is no division. There's only division because they allow it. You know, like and and we're trying to become a greater people, you know, and like and that we import and have solidarity across the world. That across the world, if you're a freedom-loving person, we'll give you the same rights, no matter what our politicians say, uh, that we as people stand with you, regardless of what's going on at the top. I really have come to the understanding that democracy is basically not something that works, um, especially if there is such a thing as group politics, group identity politics, or group think at all. Because as soon as you have one group that's exercising rule over another group, regardless of how you divide them, what minority and majority you're creating there, whether it's along racial lines or along economic lines, it doesn't matter. That is inherently violent. And then if you are attempting to enforce any rule like that over another group of people, that is a violation of natural law in and of itself, because you cannot grant rights to a group or to an individual that inherently an individual does not have. That's right. And when it comes to identity itself, true identity does not, you're not granted your identity from status with a group or your cohesion with a group's thoughts or ideas. Your identity comes from your individuality. And what that means literally is that you're internally indivisible. You're undivided. So that would mean you're undivided from your connection to your body through through your health being mm-hmm. strong. You're undivided through to your connection to your spirit because you know what you truly want and you're putting those steps into into play every day and doing the work required to manifest that. And that's where your identity comes through. Uh, that's your soul is that thing that motivates you to do anything. And once you are starting once you've started on the path of being motivated by your own originality, which is another way of saying your own source, your origin. Mm-hmm then that is when you're actually able to start moving in this positive upflow direction of waking up. But that's going to be, you're, you're not going to need rule of law. You're not going to need government, government, which is actually just mind control. The word itself means mind control. You're, you're going to be invested in your own sovereign authority. And um, that is what it, what I'm describing as the true definition of freedom. And like we were saying with someone that, has the thought that they still have a chance being unbeatable. A free human that knows they're free is completely uncontrollable. Not just uncontrollable like, I've I've come to think that it's not just that you're uncontrollable like you can do whatever you want but you might die for it. I think that like you were talking about with the code of the samurai, if you do act in harmony with natural law, you will be safe. Yes. Nothing can actually, the fear structures, fear, Fear-based, control-based uh, hierarchies and institutions cannot do anything to you but convince you that they can do something to you, which is the same as your agreement. Mm-hmm. And so it's really, again, about saying saying no to things. It's about um, revoking your agreement to different things by no longer participating or even in some cases it's valid to just make a statement um, or frequently make the statement that – there's that you you disavow and disallow any and all forms of control or 
um, outside uh, tampering with your life from anything, anywhere, at any time. And that, like we were saying about speech itself, creating a, an actual physical effect in the world at large, speaking, speaking your intention in that way does affect your life and does change your life. And you will, even if you don't know how you're going to take steps away from these uh, control and dependency structures, they, the steps will appear, the path will appear as you move past each obstacle that you currently face. Yeah. And again, back to Da Vinci, you know, each obstacle, you know, the genius of persevering over an obstacle. And then that's what we have to do. Although I would also say that we've needed, we, it's about trajectory. Like, and so democracy actually served a purpose. But again, it, it, we live in this world where these, there's these false equivalency, false equivalencies, which we think democracy is related to law and it isn't. Democracy is only the manner in which we put people in charge. What makes at least in our country, at least the, what's supposed to be us is law. So, and nobody, and everybody, every American knows this, that the rule of law does not apply to everybody equally. However, though, what is absolutely true, and this was the wisdom unto which this was founded, is that it's supposed to, and it's set up to. But we did not do a good job of making that because that's what controls democracy. The rule of law is over the rule of democracy, and which is to suggest that no matter who you are at the very top, you will be absolutely beholden to the exact same laws as are at the very bottom. If I steal a hundred bucks from a candy machine, then they're going to come and arrest me. But there's nobody believes you could completely wreck hundreds of thousands of people's lives, kill innocent people. I mean, the most egregious injuries. And this is where we actually have laws. So like the most important aspect for us to actually get control over is the rule of law. And whereas I would absolutely prescribe to you on the idea of freedom and the free person and the view of the free person that our society, our, our humanity as such as it exists here has these structures and the, and they were the best things that could the best minds over thousands of years could construct but there is no level at which we believe in it because of the politicization of it so like if, if we really believe that, and that's why the law is the way it is, is because there's supposed to be an arbiter. So when there's a conversation or a disagreement, there's a third party into which to look at the problem and then solve it. And that there's a joint set that based upon the grievances involved of how it always turns out. And that's actually what's been lost. So it's actually not even the highest, it's not the Department of Energy. It's not the Department of Just or of of it's not the White House, it's the Department of Justice. Because if the White House knows that the Department of Justice is going to get your ass, <laughs> they'll stop doing dumb shit, you know. And that's the only thing that stops them. The law is the only thing that stops exploitation. Well, other than natural law, which will inevitably crumble and destroy the the institutions that are based on falsehood, but that's not a fun path to go down. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I want to preserve the law, because I know that if we can apply this equally and being that we all both have freedom within ourselves and we seek freedom of all other people at the same time, like true as we truly should as freedom loving people, not freedom loving people, freedom needing people like we need to be free. We need the energy to follow our own our own dreams and the but only there's way that order actually is constructed the, you, you big can, order yes yeah order the order that comes from fear-based control and not freedom is always a dark order yeah absolutely always every time it's just like the aspect of mocking there's times when i've been really clever and it could be very mocking you know but i'm always wrong when that happens there's never a moment that that makes that good. And that's what, and it goes to that point where, well, if the seed is bad, the plant is bad. You know what I mean? And we've just let these seeds plant way too long and we didn't pull them up by the roots when we should have. And I don't even mean your generation. I don't even mean my generation. I mean, generally the one that came before it. And I could really get into like Marcus Aurelius and some of their other views about why this turns out and the progression into which it turns out. But we're here again, but we have an advantage that they've never had before. The, at least to the best of our knowledge, um, and that's the power of connecting humanity. 
like right now you can go and make up they made microsoft you know in in a garage <laughs> you know and it's the most powerful age that we have ever known and who knows where all the people are that might even be listening to this conversation right now. Yeah, absolutely. Anywhere in the world. And that's Any another time in the future. That's right. And that's another reason why I, why I really want to promote and hit home the idea that we share, and I say Americans, I say it only because we're here and lived here, we're born here, but that is an idea and it is not a place. And it is that we are all equal as humans for the law and we share a common humanity and we will do everything that we can to preserve and protect that for each other. And when we say that that is the reason that we have government, that's the reason we govern ourselves is for that. Sun Tzu talks about this. I know that sounds crazy within the art of war, but it is, it's absolutely tied to humanity, you know, and, and saying that the only time ever to fight, the only way to not destroy your own country is to only fight to preserve that which is perishing, which must be saved. If you ever fight, a fight that is not to preserve something that which is perishing and needs to be saved, then you are wrong. <laughs> you know, so it was the art of the art of it, which is like, and when you do that, what this really means, and, and we see this tied to vets and, and homelessness and all kinds of stuff, which is if the soldiers truly believe in what they're doing, then they come back and actually feel pride. If they've been told a lie, like, so in World War II, you know, like it was political. There was the draft and everything. But everyday Americans felt like we're keeping Jews from being burned alive in ovens by the millions. You know, they're going to exterminate them from the earth. So your common average American is going to be drafted anyway. He's like, this ain't about politics. I'm going to go and kick some ass. This is worth it. It feels good because this is evil and wrong. They brainwashed. They're using propaganda. Everything we hate today, they, they hated then. Right. And so they go and they feel that that's what they did, even if they committed egregious human crimes. But when they come home, we, they still felt like they were somebody and they actually could overcome. They might even feel guilt about those actions. But within them was the idea that I was doing to the best of my understanding to protect humanity. And but look at Vietnam generation when they absolutely knew they were exploited, that Russia and America didn't want to fight in their countries, they wanted to fight in another country. And the CIA starts this Gulf Tonk and all that stuff, right? And so then you start the draft and you have people pulled into it. Well, when I was, this is my dad. My dad and all his brothers went, four of them. And the Vietnam vets, when you go and you, it's war, so it's always hell. You know, it's always hell. It's never not hell. There's no such thing as war that isn't a hell. And so you come back and you've been asked to do these things, these possibly terrible things, and you don't believe in what you did. And you come home, you know what you're thinking about? There. You're not thinking about here. You could come home, be here back for a decade, but you're thinking about the most profound experience you ever had, well, which the other, was that. The other thing with that is uh, when you're joining a military, especially a modern military, you're, but I think this has had to have been true throughout the ages, um, you're being conditioned to follow orders no matter what. And that is uh, another way of disconnecting you from your own soul because if you're not acting based on your own original motivation your own yeah. original thought um what you are is your soul is dying from that so absolutely you are a soul dire mm -hmm. soldier it's poison it's po like to not to to not ever teach it is to poison them to simply leave it out is to poison them. It's the only reason you should ever and even then it's the most serious decision you've ever made to ever fight even just fight it should only be over the most intrinsic level of protection. Like the to protect a defenseless war. child. Yeah, it, like these really intrinsic, it's the only reason ever. And the kind of what I was getting at about Vietnam is, so up until the current wars, 70% of our homeless were Vietnam vets, but 1% of Americans had ever been in Vietnam. Think about that. <laughs> and the reason is, is because you can't just come, when you don't believe, so if you did really horrible things when you were young, what are you thinking about? What if you were vastly traumatized? You, and especially if you don't, if you're not really strong, if you don't have a lot of endurance and those things plague you and grieve you, you think of those things and you replay them in your mind over and over and over. And, 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 you know, there's people that can make it out of that, but most people don't. Most people are so traumatized and they, they are victimized and then they become victims. There's a difference in those two things. So you can be victimized, but if you keep letting yourself live it, then you are a victim and you will continue to be a victim.
You can be victimized, and at that moment are a victim, but then you can overcome it. You know, and that's the moment of truth. When and that, either you do it in the moment that it happens, or sometime later down the road. But the moment of truth can come where you uh, think about the situation in a way where you either forgive yourself for it or come to a deeper understanding and about the causality of the event and or you're able to self forgive or forgive the other person that mm -hmm. did the victimizing to you. That's another thing that has to be done in order to sever that energetic connection and keep it from carrying forward into the future and traumatizing you more. Eckhart Tolle talks about that and he refers to it as your pain body. Mm -hmm. So if you don't control your pain body, then it can essentially overcome you. And the way that someone becomes a victim is by putting greater importance on um, usually a past event than the current moment or um, yeah, that's, that's what he said about how someone becomes a victim. And then on the flip side, obviously he talked about not wanting to put too much importance on what you are imagining in the future either, but yeah. Yeah. And well, it was just a balance to be struck between those things. And, you know, that's kind of a saying a little bit about the different vets. So you had almost no World War II vet homeless, but almost a staggering level of homelessness amongst Vietnam vets is because one was taught that part of what they did and reasons that they had a humanity that they could forgive themselves over those gr grievances, but at the same time feel like they did what they had to do, even though they were forced to do it you know, or die or be locked up away from your family or any given things, right? And then on the other hand, in Vietnam, they a lot of times, and I don't mean this for everybody, but to reconcile things that you know that are the greatest human crimes, you can't just come home and be all right. You can't go to work in GE and be thinking about parts when you've been thinking about, oh, I did this by mistake, you know? And that's why it's so important to connect our humanity to all of our actions and in everything that we do. And, um, and that's again, that, that thread that's running through our society. We see all these symptoms like that is like Vietnam is more a symptom. It's not even the problem. The symptom is that we have not been diligent in absolutely governing the forces that, that we as Americans create with our money, with our industry, with our work. And that we don't talk about it collectively. And, and we do see that. These things like these podcasts, that's what does connect us in a way that hasn't happened before. And I really see this as, a, as the greatest. I look at right now as literally one of the greatest opportunities in human history. Because there's more power dispersed to more people than any time I've ever known in recorded history. But it matters. It's like a, it's like a bow that's been drawn and has no place to aim the arrow yet. And so we've got all this energy. You see all these marches and people. That's energy. It just, there's no leaders directing it to where it needs to go to the heart of the matter. Well, I don't know if leaders can do that. I think that the only way that the transformation can occur is to happen within each individual and they become their own leader instead of being led. In mystery traditions, you would consider someone made, uh, that was uninitiated into natural law and truth and philosophy as being leaden or dead like heavy dense and that you know that makes sense the word lead is about being led by something external so uh, i i don't see leaders per se as being the way out of this other than um there will be it will be important for all of us to become as, as many of us who are able to actually see things more clearly now then uh, the, you know those of us that are around us, those people will have to distribute leadership, like you're saying, because it'll be leadership as in you're, you're leading by example. And yeah, and the Taoists are so beautiful. That's the thing is that leadership is a matter of nature. It's never contrived. And so the thing is, if we fight, if me and you and and you have this discussion on a level that matters, and we do that with our clerks in our stores. Or in any top to bottom. No, that's how we met, man. Yeah, I know. Top to bottom. When we do that, leadership will naturally rise. Dials talk extensively about this. It's so beautiful because people do need to be led. You know, I get what you're saying, and when you're self-governing, you're so right. You could be beyond the universe. That is not true for everybody. Everybody in their own time. And there's sometimes more important that I reach 75% of the way across the table instead of 50. You know, and, yeah. and I get and because there's been times in my life where That's I've been compassion. so broke. That is compassion. And I've been so broke down by where I couldn't go on 
physically like no and my will wanted to but i couldn't like broke physically but then somebody come up and pick me up and carry me the rest of the way i went on to do other things that mattered but i just couldn't there's things that can't happen with two hands can't be done there are things that can't be known if somebody doesn't tell you and it's not that you're telling them or leading them it's it's like taking a shade off of a lamp and the light simply goes out you know into space and then it becomes to the eye and they can see it and we need these things and leadership when i say leadership and it's very hard this is why you need lengthy discussion you can't have these discussions in short order it takes time and leadership will naturally arise when harmony is in place there is no leadership otherwise so what i'm saying leadership they're not leaders that's my point so we as we put our hands on the ground and we grow good food and we grow good children we grow good relationships. We grow right action. Leadership will arise, but we have to be willing to accept it because you can't do every job. You can't do all the things that you want to do in your own life by yourself. That isn't possible. And so, and when we, I think when we accept that, that I can do great things myself, I can do amazing things with others. You know, both. You can do both. If you want to travel fast, go alone. If you want to travel far, go together. Yes, absolutely. Many hands make light work. That kind of all those kind of adages, you know. But it's so true. And the, and the, those essence, there's essences that we take for granted that make their way through that. And it's I think a lot of that. And I've struggled with this. Like when I was younger, and I'm not going to say I don't today, but I think I do a much better job struggling with ego, struggling with hubris, especially when you think you're smart and you're not. You know, and um, and the truth of it, you know, that it's not what I think, you know, like in my own case, I thought I could do anything at one point, literally unstoppable, untrue, you know, it doesn't mean even my, it's not even about my level of reason. You could fall off your roof tomorrow, be paralyzed and you'll never be able to use your body again. What you going to do? You're going to need others, but you might go on to be Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking talks about how he could never be who he is. He could never know the science, his understanding of things without his condition, not even possible, and without the people around him. When you look at every, I mean, when you look at greatness, and you know, when I say greatness, I mean that in whatever given people would call great in their field, whether it's art or whether it's sports. Like, okay, so sports would be a great example. So you've got certain, the ones that are truly great are usually come from the hardest circumstances. Not every time, but usually they come from like where like, this is my out. <laughs> like this is, I don't, I'm not going to get educated because school sucks or like, I just can't do that. And they, they, my body's my way out. My town's my way out. When they get to the top and they went through all the years that have went by and they're in, you know, go to the hall of fame 30 years later, they're like, I, without my coach to tell me what to do to guide me when I didn't know, I could have never done any, of the, not even any of those things. Without my, when I was 13, without this guy, who was only with me for a year, I would have never been any of this. You know, and that's very poignant because it's, again, it's about trajectory, force, and energy. Same way in transmission, you know, and, and what that does is it allows our humanity to connect. You know, that, that we can create, we can create something that we can't even fathom. Hmm. You know, like it's, uh, we we are a living bridge between the present moment and the next world. But whenever we are disconnected from one another, the bridge breaks. That's I think why we feel so separate in consciousness now from our ancestors and from our descendants, and even to the point of being willing to to a tell tell lies about our ancestors. Uh, about what actually happened and be or not care what happened right and then be to um basically screw over the the descendants by not living in balance and harmony with our natural world yeah so the more that we can create that interconnectivity of true care not just interconnectivity of basic connection because we we're there with the internet right now we are all connected to many people at, at very least to the people that we care about um personally in a way that keeps us from having to be separate, even if we're physically at a great distance from one another. But until we then apply the actual care principle, the heart itself, um, just 
basically giving a shit and doing the right, what you know to be the right thing as a result of that feeling, um, we'll, we'll never rebuild that bridge. We'll never, we'll never create the, uh, the future that is best for our descendants. And again, we'll never understand what wisdom the ancestors have been holding and um, attempting to pass down to us this entire time, both through the living spirit of our consciousness that extends beyond our bodies that, uh, you know, that we're all that pool that we're all drawing from, including those that came before, but also our physical ability to, um, to do what we need to do in the world to be in that balance and that harmony. I mean, just looking at ancient civilization, they reached heights far greater than what we can imagine right now. And the evidence is all around us from pyramids in Egypt to, um, you know, civilizations in South America and many, many, many things beyond what we've ever even discovered because we're not looking. But the ultimate truth is, uh, as the Kabbalists say, is under your nose the entire time. It <laughs> is your heart. Mm -hmm. That is the balance point. That's the arbiter that's missing between the left and right sides of your consciousness. And it's why, and as above, so below reflection, we exist in a world where the left and the right are constantly at war with no mediation taking place. The heart is missing. It's the skull and the bones, but no heart. It's the, it's, um, we're living in a world where thought and action are manifesting separated from feeling. And yeah. And that's, and that's why it's so ugly. You know, and but here there's a beauty to that. Like so, and you're right insofar as that philosophically, that um, this could go could turn out either way, but I really believe it's not because the truth is we are strong and they are weak because their principles aren't worth shit. And that's the thing is when things aren't true, they burn out. They're gonna burn out. As long as we connect and just keep doing what we're doing, feeding people, being like, let me tell you, let me give you a metaphor here. The only way to get rid of parasites is to starve them out. Don't give them anything. Don't Which is why we have to get off of the United States dollar. Yeah. And that's something I actually wanted to touch on a second ago. Yeah. Getting out, getting out of the monetary system. If you have, if you're in the monetary system, then you've got a dependency on it and you can't be truly free. So, and a karmic connection to all those things that we were just talking about in terms of war and, uh, and yeah, absolutely. Kind of that's how you stop them. them. That's what I mean. Those blood sucking parasites that continue to feed off of our labors and our, my money, your money, our efforts, like that's not okay. And that makes me angry, you know, and like I said, I don't use it for violence, but I use it for fuel and I don't want to forget. I don't want to be okay with it. We got people dying, breaking their souls, breaking their hearts, breaking their minds, putting people in hell every day, you know, and in my mind, it's one of the most important things. And truth is that, I mean, I'm getting older and I'm not carrying the same level of fight probably as I once did, but I'm in the, I'm on the path of creation. I'm here to make things, not break things anymore. And what I can do is not give them anything. I don't give them my respect. I don't give them my attention. I don't give them my money. They get nothing from me. Parasites get nothing. And that's the way we do it. We can, if, because that's why we're strong and we're, and we are just beginning. We're just getting this shit started because as we plant Food, literally, and it's a literal, it's uh, as well as figurative. It is literally both. That as we put our food, food in the ground and we work our bodies, we become the strongest as they become fat and weak and sick. And I mean more on, when I say fat, I just talking about taking everything, all the money, all the, the greed that comes from it. When they, they're so, because of nature, they cannot perpetuate. But because we feed our natures, it may take more time than we want, and it may not turn who we expect, but it will turn out just like it must. And so they can't feed themselves anymore. They're not based in anything. They're based in these uh, fallacy systems. That's like, right. Like and so, which has no actual value. And we mm -hmm. give them the value of the system that they are at the top of. Exactly. Because we believe <laughs> in it and continue to use it. So like that's, that's the big secret of the, uh, the Illuminati is that the average citizen is a card-carrying Satanist without even realizing it. And by that, I mean the average citizen 
isn't thinking about what's true and not true. They're thinking about truth in a relative way or in a dogmatic way that's been handed to them from their parents or their religious hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so really this, uh, this path of self-discovery through um, applying intuition that's heart-based and acting in accordance with what is right and therefore compassionate and loving, that's the that's the, that should be what guides us, I guess. Yeah. And that's what the remedy is. And so like, if we act like that amongst our group and continue, the thing is that is the nature of generation and Genesis. So therefore that's what will be perpetuated from it. So you, because it's a course of natural law. So you have uh, disconnected from like taxes and stuff successfully. Like relatively, relatively. Yeah. You know, and, um, it's hard to explain a little bit how I go about that sure. right now. Um, but I would refer back to the principle at which I just said, which is I vote with my money. Yes. I give my money to those who deserve it. And I don't gen and I'm not saying there's no exception. It's not about being a saint. It's just about being aware, being conscious, continuing to be better. Yes. And continuing the trajectory, you know, uh, you know, just up, we're not going straight up. We're just going up. <laughs> and so, you know, and what I do is, and I, and I want to pay, there is a common good and there is a place for leadership, for government. There is a place for these things because there are things that are very serving to us and it can lead to amazing things in its stead. But at first we have to start living in accordance with natural law. Then naturally justice will arise. That's the, because justice is natural. I, mean, I don't know that we think of it that way, but it is. Justice arises naturally when you are in a just society. And that's what we have to do first. And, and again, it's as ugly as it is because those little ethnicities groups, not ethnicities, but just power groups that are all tearing for these little bits of, of power at the top, they're going to cannibalize. We, we've seen this time and time again. That's how the Renaissance comes about. That these things come about for reasons, and I hope it's as benevolent as it can be. But I, it really can't be when you look at what's going on in the worldwide. You know, when you're considering all that stuff. And but we're going to we're going to go the other way. That's a, we we have merit, and that's why we'll win. We have uh, the con we have conscience, which is the, the same thing as common sense. Con, which is together, and science, mm -hmm. scary to know. Right. So, um, by all together working for the common good, which is also another, isn't the same thing as conscience. Any chaos that comes our way, we will be able to yes. create an order that is good out of mm -hmm. that because it's yeah. founded in love and compassion and truth. Yeah, and, and that means that every it's like when a fire and everybody cares, everybody comes running. You know, you can't, you can't defeat that. Like, you know, and the, and the thing is that once they get punched, they'll all run for the exits. They'll all run to get theirs. You know what I mean? And that's what I mean. We're going to, we're going to, it's going to go the other way. It must. It's always been true in human history, suffrage, civil rights, all that stuff. And it's coming and it's going to be ugly, probably uglier than ever before. Cause we know more than we ever before. And there's more of us. Yes. So many more. Well, guys. It's been a killer conversation. Um, I'll ask both of you. Got any closing remarks here? <laughs> I don't think so. That was uh, that was great. That was that was a great conversation. Very very enlightening. Yeah, I, I hope so for everybody listening. Uh, I've been dying to have this conversation with you because we keep we we touched on it barely. But um, you you one last thing I guess you mentioned about how uh, you know speak with your clerk at the store, speak with the guy at the gas station, speak, speak truth to the uh, stranger on the bus next to you. Just wherever, op wherever the opportunity arises, if you're grounded in truth, you'll have the opportunity to also speak it. And you can't just take in our words or words like from people like us or, uh, and just think about it. You do have to also speak it. That is the third part of the triangle. That is actually the, that is the return of the arbiter. The return of the heart right. is you from your Grounded in heart and truth, you speak it to anybody at any time. And that amazing thing is going to occur from that. And um, this is a roundabout way of saying this was an amazing thing that occurred in a, a very similar fashion because you and I just started talking to each other in the grocery <laughs> store as both customers at the grocery store bump into each other a few times. And it's, as soon as we like just look at each other, we're in it. The same exact type of conversation as we've just had for the past hour plus. So uh, it's it's fantastic to meet individuals such as yourself. And I think 
uh, if you're up for it, we should do this again uh, before too long because this has been really great. You should do this, actually. You've got if, – fuck, man. You would be great at this. It's not that hard, podcasting. Yeah, I get a lot of people that tells me that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the uh, truth is I just don't know what to do. <laughs> like, uh, and, and I know that sounds like odd, but there's there's so many facets to which – I find interesting and um, ultimately that's what you should do is what's interesting at the time. Yeah. And I know that you're right. And it may be that truth is I've also been a hermit for so long too. I'm very disconnected from technology. So like I just recently got my first cell phone a couple of years ago. I've, I have some basic computer literacy, but I don't have any of that that you need. Yeah. Um, but I a hundred percent though, I'm down for coming back again. I would do this. I, I do believe in what you, to go back to what you said just ago, when we see each other, it's, it's because of cultivated energy and it's simply by its nature must find itself. And that's the, that's what I mean about saying about nat- how justice will rise from nature. It will naturally like all organism perpetuate itself in the best manner possible. Given what you've cultivated, I've cultivated, she's cultivated, those things naturally come together and that just makes sense. And so, um, you know, and I'm definitely interested in doing it again. Uh, we talk about any number of things. Um, and I appreciate it. Like, I think these things are really important, um, that we have to share ideas. Um, and we have to be willing to have difficult conversations, you know, and so that, cause that's the way breaking something happens a lot of times. And we have to completely redefine the nature of our language. Uh, and a little bit about like when, you know, some about talking to others, it's, uh, it's an actual literal energy. I'm literally sending waves of sound, which could be measured through scientific instruments, hitting somebody and enlisting even thousands of biochemical responses that are all measurable. And not just speaking to the learned, but also the unlearned. Oh, well, I'll quote, quote Walt Whitman with that one. One of my favorite poets says, I will not descend to the level of politicians and charlatans. <laughs> and so but and i say that i'm not trying to disparage them it is absolutely imperative that we all t- every every group every person even children you know like it's uh some of the greatest wisdom comes from those with the least agendas and or the know, least experiential trauma to block them from their self yeah and that's what children has a lot of times you know what i mean they just they're just saying stuff <laughs> and uh and a lot of times it's just what's on their mind or in their heart and they've not learned to uh, learned <laughs> it's funny condition to condition to uh to govern those responses in such a way you know but that's what we're doing you know we the, there's things that are different that have never been true before and to the best of our knowledge um as long as we continue to feed, what we feed grows Yes, and you know, for good or for ill. Where, and energy flows where attention is directed. Yeah, and it'll turn out for good or for ill. And that's why also you do need, that's why you have to do justice so leadership will arise. Because if you don't, if you don't govern it, then bad can arise just like good can. Actually, when you um, map the major arcana of the tarot to the Kabbalah, Tree of Life, justice is the top. It is Keter, the crown. Yeah. It rules all. Yeah. At least in that metaphysical wisdom tradition. But... There's evidence to suggest that the the tarot as we have it today is something that's continued on from ancient, ancient Egypt or even before. Oh, yeah. And to the best of our knowledge, and again, in my mind, that goes to exactly what I was talking earlier about, you know, what is America? Actually, the thing that it's supposed to be, which is different than democracy, is the land of law, the justice. Judgment, you know, to be judgmental, but to make judgment. And so it's the highest crown because the, the law is what says the same is true for Senator X as it is for chance. You know, that given the same crime, we get treated the same. And if, if we really truly believe that, we would be much happier and harmonious in our society as a whole. Some of these problems wouldn't even come about if we really believed that the institutions we already have did their job. Hmm. The idea that we would have to have somebody even do this for us is ludicrous you know that so like i was talking to my girlfriend a while back and um she you know as she was like we need somebody who who can be to the somebody who can execute law truly and justly we should create a position to do that and to adhere. i was like that's what politicians are supposed to be <laughs> it's yeah. just that we've not that's what i'm saying so these institutions exist 
I think you can't. We've not been diligent. I think you can't centralize it into a, like, I don't think that it can work if the people making the decisions don't know the people who they're making the decisions for. Yeah. And so the only way that there can be like that level of like the role of a politician should never extend beyond their like local town. Yeah. And that's, that's the only way I could see having any form of governance as we currently have remaining in the future. This whole federal government thing that should just go I know away. it's so go away. it's so crazy, and the truth is, I believe there are other ways that the a central institution can be applicable, um, but it's in a way that I've not been able yet to see or conceive. And as and, long as it doesn't get invested with rights that a regular human doesn't have, then that would work. But then they can't do much executing of uh, of justice in that in that capacity. Yeah. So then it returns to us being sort of responsible for each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that will come about, you know, like just we do like there is a place for justice. Stepwise and, progression. Yeah, and we we'll, we're just going to have to do the long work, which is we grow we do the best to not eat poison. <laughs> you know, to apologize and mean it, get good rest and good sleep like I was saying earlier and and that recognize that we have a threat in our humanity and uh and that what if we plant good you know, food, good fruit will result from, result from it, you know, and uh, and that's what we're doing. I think we see that. I, I know it seems like the world's on fire, but in my mind, it's just the old order clinging with their last little death claws and we're coming to loot the joint. And, <laughs> you know, like if you want to come along, great. But we're, you know, water's wet, sky's blue, this is bullshit. And we don't have to listen to this anymore. And because we will build our house upon a meritocracy the, the merit of our actual will determine the outcome. We've not yet earned that. That's why it's still ugly. But there's a day that as we do these things and we go through the motions of seeking a little bit better governance, of seeking a little bit better system of the way that we do justice, and we start by acting that way, then naturally that will arise through our institutions. Because they're made up of people. That's and right. And if people are all learning from each other right. and acting in accordance with the same set of true principles, then the institutions that they make up will be... Um, organisms also aligned with truth. Yes, absolutely. Like we are, you know, and I mean, like our very nature. Nailed it, guys. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. All right, we're signing off. Yeah, later.